Good evening. You are listening to LPJ. Speaker Radio with Mr. and Mrs. Sweet Thing. How are you today? Oh, I am doing fine. And how are you? I'm fine. And how are you? Hope you had a great day. It was a lovely day because we are all here together again, ready to praise and lift up our Heavenly Father name. I know that many people are probably enjoying the Super Bowl right about now. Yes. But we're going to be here doing something even more important than that. And it's bringing you some showers of blessings, which is the title of the show, from our praise and worship music to praise our Heavenly Father tonight. Yeah, we are enjoying the Super Bowl. I mean the Super Bowl. We are enjoying a Super Bowl. Mm -hmm. A bowl, a Super Bowl, all blessings. Super Bowl, yes. <laughs> And we got uh, a lot of that gospel music coming your way. The uh, scripture tonight will be in Proverbs chapter 10, verse 22. The Lord's blessing brings wealth, and he adds no trouble to it. No trouble. If any trouble is added, we added it. Yeah, Not we him. <laughs> and we need him to help us get out of it. If hey, we man. <laughs> But he doesn't add. He only adds blessings to our life. Blessings on top of blessings. And we add trouble to our life by that's thinking right. we know what we want and then going after it and getting it and realize that's not what we want. And it brings up a bucket of trouble. Yes, it does. And then we call on God to help us out. And he does. And he does. Because he already know when we ask for it, we didn't know what we was asking for. <laughs> he already knows I'm going to have to help you get out of this. Once you get it. Yeah. So he always lend a helping hand to lift us out of darkness once we fall off into the dark hole. Mm -hmm. You heard that on LPJ. And that is love, love peace, peace, and, and joy. joy. As we sing tonight, make up your mind right now that you're going to give your life to Jesus. If you need to be saved, don't waste another moment, but come to Jesus right now. While you have time, come. Is there one tonight? Unto Jesus. Why?
section and the Lord is healed with you. Why don't you? Why don't you? Come on, come on, come on, come on. Come on. Right in here.
God's will is the way of life for me. I'm saved and my soul has been set free.
just for the asking. Sometimes I get rain, but I'm holding on just the same. Through the sickness, storm, and the rain, I got to hold on to my.
Sometimes my patients aren't quick to share their symptoms, but I remind them that preventive screenings are key to their health. For prostate cancer, a simple blood test could help save your life. If you experience frequent urination, pain in your back, hip, or pelvis, tell your doctor. When caught early, chances of survival increase nearly 100%. Why am I proud to be an advocate medical group physician? 
is about keeping my patients healthy.
Lord, please fill it up. I need your power. Oh, the Holy, Holy Ghost. Come on, I'll show. Wash all of my sins. Wash them all.
from dangers that I could not see. God is so wonderful to me.
prepares for battle. Today I claim victory over Satan by putting on the whole armor of God which you have given me. Truth, righteousness, peace, faith, salvation, and the sword of the Spirit. By faith, your warrior has put on the whole armor of God. I am prepared to live this day in spiritual victory. The advantage of the internet is we have access to unfiltered information from all around the world. And the disadvantage is we have access to unfiltered information from all around the world. On the internet, it's sometimes hard to know what's true and what's not true. And truth is essential to making wise choices in life, especially the spiritual life. And denying and distorting God's truth, well, that's Satan's number one strategy. We are in week three of a nine-week series titled Spiritual Warfare, Terms of Engagement. And today's message is called the girdle of truth. Just as a Roman soldier's belt supported his other weapons, so biblical truth is the part of our spiritual armor that supports all of the others. Understanding the premium God places on truth, well, that's critical to spiritual victory, and we'll explore truth in depth on today's edition of Turning Point. Turning Point with Dr. David Jeremiah. Every day, we are in a spiritual war for our faith. Fortunately, God has given us a spiritual suit of armor to defend ourselves from the temptations and schemes of the devil. Equip yourself for spiritual battle with the Warrior's Prayer. 
This practical bookmark is a visual reminder of the spiritual weapons available to us as Christians. Spend each day praying on every part of the armor of God. By faith, your warrior has put on the whole armor of God. I am prepared to live this day in spiritual victory. Request the Warrior's Prayer Bookmark absolutely free of charge when you contact Turning Point today. Spiritual warfare is real. It is daily and it is personal. Arm yourself for spiritual battle with answers to questions about spiritual warfare by Dr. David Jeremiah. From his decades of teaching on this important topic, Dr. Jeremiah provides more than 70 answers to critically important questions concerning conflict in the spiritual realm. This book is a weapon of mass instruction, and it will help you develop strategies for victory in spiritual battles, find solutions to overcome Satan's schemes, identify battle strategies of the unseen world, put on the full armor of God, and effectively use the sword of the Spirit. Order your copy when you support this program with a gift of any amount. For more ways to fortify your spiritual defenses, order the Spiritual Warfare Study Set. With this set, become battle-ready with answers to questions about spiritual warfare. Hone your spiritual strategy as you watch Dr. Jeremiah's complete teaching series on DVD. Prepare yourself for spiritual conflict with his correlating study guide. And equip the armor of the believer at a moment's notice with the Warrior's Prayer Bookmark, included free. This comprehensive study set is yours in appreciation of your gift of $60 or more. Dr. Jeremiah wants to help you live out your faith in spiritual victory. Order these practical resources when you support the ministry of Turning Point today. We have lived through some interesting times in your lifetime and mine. One of the most interesting had to do with the end of the Cold War. Os Guinness describes the power of truth during that time with these words. He said, the year was 1989. It was widely described as the year of the century. Set off by the stunning collapse of the Soviet Empire, a tidal wave of euphoria swelled around the world. Almost everyone who lived through those days has their own vivid memories of the intoxicating events. The images most sharply etched in my mind, he wrote, were of the vast rallies in November of 1989 at the climax of the Velvet Revolution in Prague. Night after night, crowds of more than a quarter of a million packed Wenceslas Square, mesmerized by the stirring addresses of this slim, boyish, mustachioed figure then dissident, later president, Vaclav Havel. Again and again, as the speakers painted the stark contrast between the revolutionaries and the regime, the quick-witted Czech crowd broke out into a chant, we are not like them, we are not like them, we are not like them, and it filled the whole arena. The contrast that triggered the refrain was the dissident's refusal to counter violence with violence. Another, a central defining feature of the Czech Revolution was the contrast between truth and lies. They, meaning the Soviet regime, are people of lies and propaganda. We, the revolutionaries, are people of truth. Or as the motto of the Charter 77 movement expressed boldly, truth prevails for those who live in truth. The same claim was staked out by the Soviet Union's own one-man dissident movement. Alexander Solzhenitsyn, in his Nobel speech, wrote, One word of truth outweighs the entire world. You see, as Solzhenitsyn and the leaders of the Velvet Revolution knew with clarity, chiseled in courage, there were only two ways for them to bring down the might of the Soviet tyranny. One was to trump their force physically. But they had no way to do that. That was impossible. The other was to counter physical force with moral, staking their stand on the conviction that truth would outweigh lies and the whole machinery of propaganda, deception, and terror would come falling down around them. As you know, if you've studied history at all, they chose the latter, and the unthinkable happened. One night, they won. They literally won. The Soviet Union was disbanded in so many respects. And the tyranny of Czechoslovakia and Romania 
and yes, even Russia, was held at bay. We've learned in the last two weeks that our enemy with whom we are involved in mortal combat is none other than Satan himself. As we learned his names last week, we also learned he's a powerful enemy who not only is a ruler and a prince, but as we learn, he's the God of this age. The Bible speaks of the wiles of Satan, so we know he's armed with many strategies. He wants to deceive us, for he is the great deceiver. He wants to deceive us because he wants to divide us. He is the great divider, and he wants to divide us because he is the great divider, and ultimately he wants to destroy us. He wants to deceive us, to divide us, so that ultimately he can destroy us. Now, his ultimate goal, as we have learned, is destruction. He deceives and he divides in order that he might destroy. His purpose is that he might cast every one of us into a Christless hell so that we'll be separated from God forever. And since he cannot do that if we are believers who have put our trust in Christ, his second plan is to drown that testimony that God has given us and keep us from being useful to the Lord, perhaps even being destructive in the Christian faith. But we are not left helpless against this enemy. We have learned that. And the Bible is teaching us that there is a way for us to be victorious. We are not left helpless because 1 John 4, 4 says, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Who is in us? Christ. Who is in the world? Satan. John tells us that the one who is in us is greater than the one who is in the world. And with Christ living in us, we are able to resist the devil. And when we resist him in the power of Christ, he has to leave us. Resisting the devil in the power of Christ is what the apostle means when he tells us in Ephesians to put on the whole armor of God. And in this armor, there are six pieces. Five of these pieces are defensive and one is offensive. All six of these pieces of armor are necessary. No part of our life can be left unprotected or exposed. The Bible doesn't tell us to choose four or five out of these pieces of armor, whichever ones we want, and to implement them. No, we are told to put on, notice, the whole armor of God. Any piece of armor we refuse to use will leave us unguarded in some vulnerable place, and we will surely be prey to the enemy. It is important to note, that God has provided no protection for our back. He expects no deserters in his army. He wants us all to stand and face the enemy and not run away as cowards. And as we look at the armor that is listed for us in the book of Ephesians, it is quite apparent that the armor is nothing less than Jesus Christ himself. The armor is Christ. In fact, when Paul wrote to the Romans, he said something very similar to what we find in Ephesians. He said in Romans 13, 14, put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Just like you put on the armor, put on Jesus Christ. In essence, he is telling us that we are to wear Christ like we wear a suit of clothes. Better, we are to wear Christ as the armor. And listen to me, the verse in Romans chapter 13 has only seven words. The seven verses of Ephesians literally give us a commentary of the seven words of Romans. When we put on the armor, we are putting on Christ and going forward in his strength to do the battle. The Bible tells us that it is our responsibility to put on the armor. The armor belongs to us. Someone has said, he makes the armor, we take the armor. We have the responsibility to implement that ourselves. The Bible doesn't say, wait for God to put it on you, but put it on yourself. Your responsibility, my responsibility, is to close ourselves with this armor, the armor of God. We are involved in a personal and private battle with Satan. It is not something we fight as a group. We fight it individually, and if we are not individually and personally and privately implementing the warrior's army, We are going to be victims instead of victors. Putting on the armor of God is our personal duty. No one can do it for us. It is our primary duty. Nothing is more important. And it is our perpetual duty. It has a never-ending responsibility. We are to be continually over and over again appropriating these truths to our lives. 
and arming ourselves for the warfare. Now, Paul begins by telling us that as we're putting on the armor, the first thing we need to put on, it it says in the scripture, the girdle of truth. We're to gird our waist with the truth. It might seem strange that the apostle starts here because, believe it or not, the Roman soldier never considered his girdle or this waistband that he wore. He never thought that to be part of his armor. In fact, this six-inch belt, which fastened around the middle, was made out of leather or linen, and it was a common piece of dress that was worn by almost all Romans, not just the soldiers. In this text, God does not use the girdle as the Romans did. No Roman would ever have called this part of his armor. He would have understood its place as the armor was used, but he would not have considered this to be part of his armor. It was a normal part of his dress. In Paul's day... The girdle, which was worn outside the long flowing robe, served at least three purposes which help us understand why we must put on this truth, this piece of armor. First of all, the girdle was used for advancing. Let me explain what I mean. Listen to what Peter said in 1 Peter 1.13. He said, therefore, gird up the loins of your mind. When a Roman was interested in moving from one place to another rapidly, He would pull up his long flowing robe that he wore and he would tuck it inside the belt that he wore around the middle of his body. He would do this so that the robe would not hinder him when he was running or advancing. So the belt was used to hold the long flowing robe so that he could advance in warfare. When a soldier from the Roman garrison was sent into battle, he would do the same thing. He would take his long flowing robe and tuck the ends of it into the girdle to free up his legs and to keep him from tripping. Paul is telling the Ephesians that they are to put on this girdle of truth and that if they do that, it will fit them for the battle. It is the first thing they are to do. It is the primary thing they do. And perhaps it is a reminder to us of what the writer of Hebrews tells us in Hebrews 12.1. Listen to this. Let us throw off everything that hinders us and the sin that easily entangles us, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. The girdle of truth, which was the first part of the armor, which Paul tells us to put on, was first of all for the purpose of helping us advance. And you'll see how this all fits together in a moment. It was also important for attacking, not just for advancing. The soldier also used the girdle to support the weapons that he carried. The swordsman, for instance, would fasten his girdle across his shoulder so that he could suspend his sword from it. And he would use this to hold his sword close to his body so he would have access to it immediately in the time of conflict. The bowman would use the girdle to support the quiver in which he kept all of his arrows so he could get to them quickly. This was a very important piece of the equipment that a soldier wore. It was important for advancing and for attacking. And there was one other simple thing that happened. It was important for awarding because when a Roman soldier was awarded with a medal, he pinned it on this girdle that he wore around his waist. It was the way you could determine whether or not a soldier had been in battle before. And if you saw him coming and he had a lot of medallions, you would know he was a decorated soldier and one perhaps that you should be wary of. Now that was the purpose of the girdle of truth in the Roman days. It held up the robes when it was time to advance. It held in the armor that they used to fight against the enemy. But what was the power of it? And here's where we need to understand what Paul is teaching us. He says this girdle has as its nomenclature truth. This piece that we wear around us is called truth. It is interesting that it is the first piece of armor. At the very foundation of the soldier's armor is truth. The battle over truth, as you know, is raging in our day. Assessing the popular view of truth, one writer puts it this way. Truth in any objective or absolute sense, truth that is independent of the mind of the knower, no longer exists. A simple way to illustrate this is in the story of three baseball umpires debating their philosophies of umpiring. Listen to this. The first one says, there's balls and there's strikes, and I call them the way they are. The second one says, that's arrogant. There's balls and there's strikes, and I call them the way I see them. 
That's no better, said the third. Why beat around the bush? Why not be realistic about what we do? There's balls and there's strikes and they ain't nothing till I call them. <laughs> the first umpire represents the traditional view of truth. Objective, independent of the mind of the knower. It's there to be discovered. The second umpire speaks for moderate relativism. Truth as each person sees it according to his or her perspective or interpretation. And the third umpire bluntly expresses the postmodern position that truth is there to be discovered. No, it is for each of us to create our own truth and to speak our own truth into the situation. They ain't nothing unless I call them balls or strikes. But as Christians, we cannot borrow from the philosophy of this world. As Christians, we must insist on the objective truth of God's word. Truth isn't about our perspective or our perceptions. It's always about reality. A majority of us could agree that we'd like gravity to be suspended tomorrow, but our vote would have no impact on reality. Americans embrace democratic ideals, and that gives us the illusion that we should have a voice when it comes to truth. But the universe isn't a democracy. And truth isn't a ballot measure. You and I can discover truth, but we cannot create it. What's true is true, and what's not is not for all of us all the time. Our culture views truth as something inside of us, subjective to revision according to our growth and enlightenment. But Scripture views truth as something outside of us, which we can believe or not believe, but it is still the truth no matter what we do to it. Sometimes people say, well, I don't believe this. And I get the impression that they think that because they don't believe it, that it seems not no longer to be true. Well, let me tell you something. Truth is truth, whether you believe it or not. Truth is not touched by your emotions, by your opinion, by your perception. And that is what's being lost in our culture today. Today, there is no absolute truth anymore. Today, in our culture, your truth might be different than my truth, but it doesn't really matter. Isn't all truth just kind of truth? No, it's not. (laughs) In a world so confused about truth, many people say, if you are Christians and you think you know the truth, isn't that arrogant on your part? But it's not arrogant to believe what the Bible teaches. In fact, it's the opposite. Arrogance is when we try to tailor truth to our preferences. I had a lady say to me one time, We were talking about punishment, and we might even have been talking about hell. I'm not sure. But she said, Dr. Jeremiah, I need you to know, my God would never send anybody to hell. And I said, you're absolutely right, because your God doesn't exist. (laughs) He doesn't exist. He doesn't exist because you don't get the right to create the God you want so that you can make him do what you want him to do. If you found the truth about who God is and how the world was created, Why do you want to spend all of your waking hours trying to discover truth that you already know? If you don't believe that truth is in this book, then search on, my friend. But if you're a Christian and you believe God has spoken and it is true, why spend all of your waking hours trying to find some kind of truth that isn't going to be true when you find it? (laughs) The Word of God is true. And this is the difference. You see, what is Satan trying to do? He's trying to deceive. What does that mean? He's trying to throw things at us that are not true. Somebody told me this week, if you want to identify a crooked stick, the best thing you can do is lay lay a straight stick down next to it. It'll show up in a minute, won't it? If you got a crooked stick, is this crooked or not? Well, let me see. Here's a straight one. Oh my goodness, that's a crooked stick. Do you know how to deal with the deceit of Satan? Lay the straight stick of God's word right down next to it and you will spot it every time. They tell me that when you join the FBI and you're being taught to identify bogus bills, counterfeit money, they spend almost no time examining counterfeit money. They teach their agents to understand the dynamics of a real bill. And when they know what a real bill looks like, they can spot a phony bill in a moment. That, ladies and gentlemen, is what we have been called to do. The way we deal with the deceiver is by implementing God's truth in our own lives. Christ the truth and the true God is our armor against the attacks of Satan. 
One of my favorite writers is a guy by the name of Randy Alcorn, and he explains it this way. He says, all truth has a center of gravity, and Jesus Christ, who declared, I am the way, the truth, and the life, is the center of gravity of all Christians' truth. He didn't say he would show the truth or teach the truth or model the truth. He said, I am the truth. And truth is personified in Jesus Christ. He is the source of truth, and the references point all of them to him as the truth. And that's why if you get it wrong about Jesus, it doesn't matter what else you get right, because he's the center of truth. Jesus Christ is the truth, and when we arm ourselves with him, we are ready to face the lies and the deceit of the enemy. Now, the common explanation of what this means ought to be evident to all of us. How do we arm ourselves with the truth? What Paul is teaching us here is that the believer, in order to do battle with the enemy, needs to know the truth, the truth about God, the truth about Christ, and the truth which is in this book we call the Bible. Why have I chosen to be a teacher? Because in my heart, I understand that what people need today is the truth. They don't need three points and a poem. They don't need some little uh, ditty, which is a church light for, for Christianettes. They need the truth. They need the truth of God's Word. We have never needed it before now like we need it now, and it has never been so scarce as it is now. And therefore, we are falling prey to all of the deceptions that come into the church. And so every day you turn around and you wonder, what in the world is going to happen next? And there seems to be very little discernment because, once again, the way you can determine when something isn't right is because you have studied and you know what is right. And what is phony and wrong begins to show up immediately when it's measured against the truth. When Jesus Christ was encountered by Satan in the wilderness, he used the truth. Do you know what he said when Satan tempted him? He said, it is written. And then he quoted from the book of Deuteronomy verses that offset the temptation that Satan was bringing against him. So I can't emphasize this enough. I think this is a clear call to all of us for a reaffirmation on the part of every Christian to an in-depth study of doctrine. Doctrine is systemized truth. Doctrine is the truth of the Word of God organized and categorized so that we can think clearly about the issues of life. In the preparation for this series, I've been reading this book that was written by Stu Weber called The Spirit Warrior. And here's what he says about the scriptures. He says, the Christian soldier must possess a strong, unshakable conviction in the reliability of scripture and in its living power to impact the battlefield. You must not allow yourselves to drift in your thinking, especially in this postmodern world that sees truth as individually centered and fluid and culturally constructed. You must also demonstrate a facility with Scripture, becoming conversant with its pages and principles on a level that is wholly involved in the dailiness of life. Every good spirit warrior constantly asks himself this question, what does the Bible say about this? about that, about anything. And usually, if he doesn't know exactly, he's studied enough to know where he can find the answer. You don't have to know all the answers by heart, but you should know your Bibles well enough to know that there are certain places where you're going to find some answers to the questions people are asking. And you will know where to go and where to find them. That's what it means to begin to be spiritually alert so that you can use the truth of God in this undiscerning generation when we understand this it makes the glowing ignorance of so much of christianity really stick out and and look ugly you know some of us we know only enough about christianity to carry on an intelligent conversation with another equally uninformed believer and that sets us up for defeat we're just waiting to be victimized by the enemy If you want to survive the battle and weather the warfare, you got to master the truth. The whole comprehensive counsel of God, the truth of God's revelation. And so you have to ask yourself, am I involved in some kind of regular, rigorous regimen of Bible study? Do I study the Bible? If not, what in the world are you doing? Do you betray yourself by thinking Paul may have overstated the whole deal? Then you are incredibly vulnerable 
and your mind, the most critical weapon you have in your battle is braced by doctrine, your soul is strengthened by biblical knowledge, you will be ready to fight the battle. If God's people would just take seriously the importance of knowing something and knowing his word, Satan would be thwarted and he wouldn't be able to get a foot in the door. Do you know there's actually a whole wing of Christianity where they so downplay using your mind, they actually teach their adherents to try their very best to take their mind out of play, to get sort of into a mental neutrality so that then they are open to whatever the Spirit wants to do. Ooh <laughs> And you know what? When you leave a vacuum open for the Spirit, you do not know which Spirit is going to come and fill that vacuum. The Bible has nothing to say about a vacuum for the Spirit. The Bible tells us that the Word of God and the Spirit of God work together in preparing a Christian to go to war. So when I read Paul's prayers recorded in the New Testament, I understand them now. I realize that Paul understood what we need to reevaluate as Christians today. Paul realized the importance of the people to whom he wrote his letters for them to know the truth. Let me just read one of the prayers that's recorded in the book of Ephesians as Paul writes to the Ephesian believers. Listen to this prayer and see if you can pick it up, what he's saying to them. Therefore also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, I do not cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. And here's what I pray, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, that you know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of his glory, of his inheritance in the saints, what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe, according to the working of his mighty power. Paul said, I pray for you, Ephesians. I pray for your wisdom and for you to understand the revelation that God has given concerning himself so that you might be able to experience the power of God in your life. There is no premium on ignorance in Christianity. I don't know who you've heard say that or how you've been exposed to that, but we ought to be, of all the people, the most studious and the most interested in growing in our faith. And ladies and gentlemen, there's never been a time when it has been easier to do that. If you have some discernment about what to read, there's materials out there to help you grow. Sometimes there's so much available to us to try to disciple people. We don't know which program to choose. There's so many of them, and so many of them are so good. There's no reason for you to go on just sort of floating along, knowing just enough to stay out of trouble for a little bit, but not enough to go to war. So whenever you feel discouraged, whenever you feel defeated, Whenever you're uncertain as to what you are to do or confused or downcast or depressed, some of that could be coming from Satan, and you better well know how to deal with it from the Word of God. There are promises in God's Word that help you fight off the adversary. You need to know these promises. We are all called to gird up the loins of our minds with God's truth. God puts a premium on his truth. God gave us this book so that we would have his truth. God loved us so much that he put it in the language we could comprehend. I, I want to tell you this, and I hope you know this. In between the covers of this book is everything God wants me to know. There's not anything outside the covers of this book that God wants me to know. He has put everything he wants me to know, everything he wants you to know, inside the covers of this book. Everything he wants us to know about himself, about his son, about eternity, about life. If you major on the study of this book, you will become schooled in the things thought important by your creator. So that's the first thing. God is interested in the truth of God. That's part of our armor. The more we know about God, the more truth we know from the word of God, the better able we are to go into battle and to be victorious. But there's another part of this that oftentimes is, is, is missed when we talk about this implement of warfare. This is not just about the truth of God. It's about the truth that is in us. We might render this verse in Ephesians 6 like this. Therefore, take unto yourself the girdle of truthfulness. Truth 
as we have talked about it, is objective. It's there. It's true or it's not true. But truthfulness is whether or not the truth we have about God has caused us to be people who are truthful. Is there truth in us? Is there hypocrisy in us? Is there, are we posturing? Are we, are we just faking the Christian life? The Bible says if you want to be a warrior in the battle against Satan, you have to have integrity. You have to be who you claim to be. And if we are like that, if we are people of integrity and of character and sincerity, we can go into battle with the power of God in our lives. We can take this objective truth that God has given us, and we can wield the sword, and we can be effective. And we'll see what that means as we go along here in these moments we have left. John wrote, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in the truth. He didn't say that my children know the truth. He said, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children are walking in the truth. In other words, they're living a life of truthfulness. Such a walk implies that we are dealing with the realities of life, with sin and with ourselves, and we're not allowing any conscious hypocrisy or any excuse or any vindication for doing wrong, nor condoning sin or anything like that. We're, we're trying to be honest before the Lord and live our lives as we want people to see us and as God has prepared us to live them. In other words, we're not faking it. We're not phony. We're not putting a spin on what it means to be a Christian. When we do battle with Satan, there cannot be any pretenders. (laughs) When you go into battle with Satan, you can't be standing there with the Word of God and know that there's something really deeply wrong in your life that you haven't dealt with and you want God to use you in a powerful way. Someone has said, you cannot traffic in unexperienced truth. I have to tell you that as Christians, and I'm a second generation Christian, by that I mean I grew up in a Christian home. I knew Christianese when I was five years old. I knew all the right words. I knew the these and the thous and all that stuff. Man, I could talk Christian. Can you talk Christian? How many of you here can talk Christian? Man, we can talk Christian, can't we? We just talk Christian. And if we're not careful, we talk Christian, but we don't walk Christian. And what this armor is telling us is that we're to put on the girdle of truth, not just the objective truth of God's Word, but the truthfulness and integrity of our own lives. That's how we are victorious in battle, which is always interesting to me because when we do battle with Satan, there cannot be any pretenders When we do battle with Satan, reality is required. The reality of the Christian life is one of the greatest assets you have as a warrior. I think our Lord illustrated the power of that in his life. I was thinking about that this week. Do you remember when Jesus was about to be taken away so they could crucify him? And he said to them, which one of you convinces me of sin? And they stood speechless and dumb, and they did not know what to say. Nobody said a word. Do you know why? Because they did not have anything they could say against him. He was absolutely everything he had claimed to be. When Christ went to the cross, the centurion, whose hands he had been committed for the execution, watched him die. And this is what he said. Truly, this man was the Son of God. How did he figure that out? He just watched him. The thief who hung on the cross said, this man has done nothing amiss. Why would he say that? He saw the reality of Christ. Christ was girded with the girdle of truth. Six times in his pastoral epistles, Paul speaks about the power of a conscience. He talks about a good conscience, a pure conscience. He also mentions that a conscience can be defiled and it can be seared as with a hot iron. What does he mean by that? He means that as Christians, we need to have a clear conscience toward God. We need to have a clear conscience toward our family. We need to be able to walk into a battle not with unresolved issues before God and before people. We need to have a clear conscience. And the Bible says that if we don't deal with the matters of our conscience, we can sear our conscience. Do you know what that means? Sear it like with a hot iron deaden the conscience, take away the sensitivity of it so that what happens to us that used to bother us 
doesn't bother us anymore. Ladies and gentlemen, to be victorious in the war against the enemy in our culture and in our generation, it demands not only that we know some truth, but it demands that we live the truth, that there's truthfulness in us. We need to be obsessed with that to the best way that we can. And I think David was like that. Do you know that I don't know that I've ever read a prayer like this in the Bible, but David prayed this prayer, and it's one that we should pray often. You know, sometimes we, we think we can hide our sin from God or that we can maybe do some other good things and maybe he'll forget about what we did. Do you know what David prayed? Listen to this prayer from Psalm 139. He said, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxieties. And see, God, if there's any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Why did David pray that prayer? Because he realized that if he had sin in his life, it would unfit him for the responsibility that had been placed on his shoulders. He not only wanted to see what he could see, but he wanted God to shine the light of his holiness on his life and reveal to him if there was anything in his life that he needed to deal with so that God could use him to the fullest extent of his usability. Rather than covering up, we ought to be opening up and asking God to see us and tell us where we need to make changes or where things are not right in our lives. The apostle says that the first piece of equipment that we put on before we go to battle is the girdle of truth. Let me tell you something about armor. You don't put it on after you get in the battle. You put it on before you go to the battle. You cannot be out there with bullets flying over your head trying to get dressed. You had better be armed before you get into the battlefield. You may say, Pastor, I'm not in any war right now. Well, good for you, but hang on, you will be. And in order to be ready when the battle comes, you have to go to some boot camp and you have to learn the Word of God and you have to ask God to give you integrity in your life. All of us must do that. Almighty God is looking for a few good men, a few good women. He wants sincere believers. He wants us to be real, sincere. In fact, that little word, sincere, is a great way for me to illustrate to you what I'm talking about. If you take the word sincere in the English language and you cut it in half, it's made up of two words, sine and serios. Sine serios. And you know what it means? It means without wax. When a person says you are sincere, they're basically saying you're without wax. That word was coined and one of the great trades when it was coined was the molding and firing and selling of gorgeous pottery. Because it was easy for a piece of pottery to be cracked in the firing process, after all the work that had gone into it, the merchants learned how they could fake it. They would take beeswax and rub it into the cracks of the pottery, and then they would paint over the crack, and unless you were skilled, you could not tell that the pottery was flawed. On the exterior, the waxed piece of pottery looked whole and untarnished. The honest merchants in that day knew that this was going on, and they would often advertise their pottery like this. They would put a sign up over their shop, and this is what the sign would say. The sign would say, Sine Sirias, our pottery is without wax. It is what it is. It is whole. There is nothing phony going on here. When you say somebody is sincere, what that means is they're without wax. They're the whole deal. They're not trying to deceive you about the reality of who they are. So to be sincere means not to try to cover up defects in order to deceive those who you're trying to impress. One important implication of all we have been talking about is how we are to use our mind to think. A huge portion of spiritual warfare takes place between the ears. <laughs> In the case of spiritual warfare, the belt is applied to your brain, perhaps, as opposed to your waist. 
This spiritual war is brain over brawn, mind over matter. It is tucking all of the loose ends of your life into the belt of truth, girding up the loins of your mind in the belt of truth is refusing to think like the average human thinks, refusing to let the world squeeze you into its mold. Things like personality, decisions, habits, work ethic, marriage, spending patterns, morals, parenting skills, giving amounts, sexual appetites, choices, actions, all of it needs to be tied together and subjected to God's truth. Everything in our life must be subjected and held together by the truth of God and measured against God's truth. The only implement of warfare that the Roman soldier had And you will see this as we go along. There's only one offensive weapon in this whole list of weapons, and that's his sword. That's it. And the Bible says the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. I can't wait till we get to that message because that's a powerful truth. The sword that was spoken about was a short sword that was used in hand-to-hand combat, and it was used to inflict injury on the enemy. And watch this. The sword of the warrior hung from the belt of truth. The sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, hung from the belt of truth. The wonderful thing to remember is that God's Word transforms us. It makes us holy. It changes us from the inside out. And that was the whole thing Jesus prayed for in the high priestly prayer. He said, sanctify them, God, by your truth. Your Word is truth. Truth is more than just facts. It is not something that we know. It is something that we act upon, and it acts upon us. We cannot change the truth, but the truth can change us. <laughs> and when we let the truth into our lives through the Word of God, through the examination of our own hearts to see whether or not we are what we like everybody to believe we are, when we do that, we begin to realize that now we can go into this battle with confidence, first of all, I know a few things. The enemy's not going to trip me up at the first level of warfare. I'm not going to be fooled by his comments. I'm going to know that there's some things in the Bible that I can point to. And number two, he's not ever going to be able to point his finger at my life and say, who are you in here fighting this battle? Look at what's going on in your life right now. I remember when my youngest son, Daniel, went off to school. He went to Northeast Louisiana University for a couple of years to play football there. And we discovered after he got there that he was the only Christian on the team. Oh, there was one guy who claimed to be the Christian. In fact, he was the head of the Fellowship of Christian Athletes. And at first, Daniel was totally impressed with this guy because he knew a lot about the Bible. He went to the Baptist church in town every Sunday. And then one day he discovered that this guy was living with his girlfriend outside of the boundaries of marriage. And you know what? It destroyed his influence over my son as well it would. How can you have power over the lives of others about the truth when you're not living the truth in your own life? That's what this is all about. We not only need to know the truth, we need to live the truth. And if we know the truth and we're living the truth as best we know how to do that in the power of the Holy Spirit, we can win the battle. That's what Paul wants us to know. First of all, everything starts from the truth. If you've got the truth, you've got some place to go. If you don't have the truth, you've got no place to go. Don't go into the battle without the truth, or you will lose every time. But you can take God's truth to yourself, and then you can embody that truth in your life. God will begin to show you how you can be victorious on the battlefield that we all face. I just got a book from a friend of mine by the name of Rob Morgan. In this book, he tells the story of a woman who was caught in the Pacific conflicts of World War II. She was imprisoned by the Japanese in China and placed in a concentration camp where copies of the Bible were forbidden, punishable if you were caught with it by the pain of death. Somehow, she acquired a small copy of the Gospel of John. And every night, she pulled her head beneath the covers, and using a small flashlight, she began memorizing the Gospel of John. As she memorized a page, she would tear it out, take it with her to the water spout, dissolve it with soap, and flush it down the drain. It was, she said later, that's when John and I parted company, when I flushed him down the toilet in the bathroom. (laughs) Just before the prisoners were released, 
a news reporter from Time Magazine entered the camp to interview some of the detainees. Later, this reporter was standing at the prisoner's gate as they came out, and most of them were shuffling along with their eyes down, looking like zombies. But this little lady was beaming and as bright as a button. The guards who witnessed all this said, I wonder if they managed to brainwash her while she was in there. No, said the reporter, God washed her brain. And my friend Morgan concludes, The writer was simply observing what Jesus had said before he was seized by the Roman soldiers who crucified him. In his great final high priestly prayer of John 17, he prayed for his disciples saying, Sanctify them by thy truth. Your word is truth. The word sanctify means make them holy, happy people, consecrated to you, your representatives in this world. It's the word, it's the truth that accomplishes this as we hear it, as we learn it, as we believe it, but most of all, as we obey it. That's what the girdle of truth is all about. It's knowing the truth and then allowing that truth to change who we are from the inside out. And if you want to be victorious in the spiritual battle that we're facing these days, that's a couple of good places to start. Maybe with a kind of a new commitment to this book. Maybe it's been laying on the counter between Sundays for a few months. And you, th- you know what? I probably ought to read this a little bit. The book that I got from my friend Rob Morgan has 100 verses from the Bible you ought to memorize. And there's a little chapter about each of these verses to tell you why the verses are important and why you should memorize those verses. You know, when I was growing up, we used to have the Bible Memory Association. We had Awana. We had all these different groups that taught you how to, and they had adult sessions for Bible memory. How many of you know the older you get, the harder it is to do that? So if you're still somewhat young, you should be storing some of that truth into your mind because when you get to be 50, 60, 70, it takes a little bit longer to do that. But do you know any of the Bible? Do you know any verses? You know, should we as Christians maybe know some verses? I mean, wouldn't that be good? I mean, that sounds really, really tried and tired and, you know, what you'd expect a pastor to say. But wouldn't it be good if we could put some of this book, this truth in our lives, so that when Satan comes to get us, we have some truth. I had a friend in this church who was a pro basketball player, He graduated from UCLA, then he played with the Lakers. He played with the Clippers when they were here in town. And Don and I got to meet them when we first came to San Diego back in the early 80s. And I remember one day he told me that he was struggling with something. And he says, what can we do? So what we decided to do was we put down four or five things that we might all be concerned about. We wrote down what they were. Then we said, let's research the Bible and find all the greatest Bible verses about those things we can find. Let's put them on cards and let's memorize those verses so when Satan comes to get us with, let's say, procrastination, we've learned all the verses that we should learn to do battle with him so we can go into the warfare and we know the truth. I don't know what your issues are, but I can promise you for every issue you have, whether it's fear or anxiety or worry or guilt or whatever, There are 10 or 12 great passages in the Word of God that if you put those into your hard drive, when the attacks came, you could do what Jesus said. You know what Jesus did? Jesus said, Satan, it is written. And then he quoted the Scripture. When he comes to you with the anxieties, you can say, Satan, it is written. Take this and quote the Scripture to him. You do that enough, you will discover something that you may never have never thought of, that Through the power of the Word of God, you can be victorious in your Christian life. And we've fallen away from that to some degree in our churches. We don't talk about it very much. And yet I wonder what would happen to us if now, with the incredible need that we have to be strong soldiers for Jesus Christ, we get back to some of the basics that could prepare us to be victorious. Well, I've said already in this series that putting on Jesus Christ by faith is the equivalent of putting on our spiritual armor, because it was Jesus who said, I am the truth. To know Christ, that's to know the truth. And to know the truth is to be prepared for Satan's denial and distortion of the truth. I have two free resources I would 
love to send you that will help you know truth through having a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. One is our booklet called Your Greatest Turning Point, and the other is...
I didn't understand that depression was a disease. If he'd been a diabetic, I'd have gotten him insulin. But I told him, get over it, you'll feel better later. I used to think medication was mind control. When he stopped his therapy, he got worse. And maybe he could have been helped. I got some bad news about your brother. We can help. Find out more. You have been listening to LPJ Speaker Radio. With Mr. and Mrs. Free Thank, we've had a great night uplifting and praising our Heavenly Father. And as always, it comes to the end. And that's the, that's the sad part. We have to stop. I know yeah, it. But, but he did give us showers of blessings. Yes, he did. Yes, he yes, did. He with did. The yeah. wonderful music. So mm-hmm. we... Just thank you for joining us tonight. And we hope you enjoyed the show. But we'll be back tomorrow night, same time, same place. Ready to praise him and lift him up again right here at Speaker Radio. And we got another uh, food for thought that you may meditate on tonight. And that is 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7. For we walk by faith and not by sight. That's right. Amen. By faith, not by sight. Because what you see sometimes ain't always what it is. Amen. That's right. But so faith... True. Faith is always true. It is. Always true. Mm-hmm. You know, so we thank you for stopping in tonight, for tuning in, and sitting back and praising and lifting up Jesus with us. As always, though, we must always thank him, always talk with him before we go out, before we leave. So, our Heavenly Father, we come before you tonight, before your throne, as we always, asking you to forgive us for our sins. For our hidden sins, Father, for anything we may have said or done in this day that was displeasing to you, I ask you to forgive us for those things. And also, Father, we always ask you to touch us. We always ask you to cleanse us. We know we need cleansing each and every day because we know that the good that we do is no better than dirty, filthy rags. So we know we need to be cleansed every time we turn around because we're just in the flesh. And the longer we're here, Father, we need to be continually cleansed with your mercy and your grace you give us. Father, so we ask you, don't stop. Do whatever it takes to keep us cleansed and keep us ready for when you come back as well as our families, our friends, even our enemies. We ask for that forgiveness heart, Father, that heart that is always willing to forgive because all of us are not ready to forgive. We're not like you, Father, got a heart to forgive. We need that. We need to be worked on. All of us need to be worked on deeply in that department because we don't have that heart to forgive as you did. We ask you, Father, to work on our, our minds for clean, cleansing them as a clean mind and a clean heart. Because that department, Father, we need worked on badly. Because we all, our thoughts are not always clean. We need you to work on us deep for that, Father. Cleanse us. Whatever you have to do, Father. Cleanse us. Father, and we need to be worked on for us, praying for others. A lot of us don't do that, Father. We all come to you, old Nemo. It's always about ourselves. We need you to work on us, Father, that when we come to you, we want to pray for somebody else. In the sea for someone else. Think about someone else and not ourselves. We're so selfish that it's always about what we need. Father, work on us, cleanse us, to give us a heart to, to think about someone else and come to you about someone else's needs. Father, work on our on our sufferness, our greed. Father, this clean us. Deep down inside, go deep in us. A lot of us don't want to admit about ourselves. We want to think that we're all right. 
the Father, I'm, I'm coming to you tonight, asking you to clean out of us that what we don't know we have in us. We got it, and we don't know it. So many of we've been in church so long, holding the seat so long that we think we are right, that we have a need of nothing, that we will ready, but Father, we're not. Do what you have to do to get us there. Father, we also ask for those that's been incarcerated for years. So many of them not ready, Father, for you. Go and touch them, Father. Prepare them for you when you come back. They don't know you. A lot of them there, and they don't know you. Their minds and hearts are so cold. And reach out and touch them, Father, that they may be willing to allow you to come in. You've been standing and knocking for a long time, Father. Touch them where they'll open the door and let you in. Father, our brothers and sisters, it's way across the water. Touch those that don't know you. And give more mercy to those that do know you, Father. Father, we just ask you right here. So many of them that's here that don't know you. Still living in darkness. Still out there in the street doing whatever they will or may. Whatever you have to do, Lord, touch them. Time is short. And souls are still in trouble. Still in the need of you, Jesus. We just ask you, Lord, whatever you have to do, reach out, touch those souls that they may turn from their wicked ways and want to walk towards your marvelous light and give their lives to you. They may turn and want to live for you, so when you come, they'll be ready. Lord, we just ask you to continue to work in our lives and do whatever you have to do in our lives to get us more ready for that day when you come back. Because we know death is like the thief in the night. No one knows when death is going to come for them. As I always say, no one knows when they're going to get that letter from death. And when that letter comes to your door, your time is up. And you don't have any time to get ready if you're not ready. So Lord, prepare us now. So when that time comes before you come, we'll be ready. Heavenly Father, we just ask you these things in your holy name. Let thy will be done here on earth as it is in your kingdom. Amen. Amen. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your grace and your mercy again today, for allowing us another day to be here, to lift up your name, Lord, to praise your name, and let you lead us and guide us every step of the way. We thank you, Lord, for blessing us as we went to and from. We ask you tonight to forgive us of our sins, forgive us of our selfishness and our pride and forgive us when we don't pray for one another. Forgive us for not loving and being forgiving towards one another. And Lord, we just ask you tonight as we surrender all to you, we ask you to cleanse us, to renew our mind and renew a steadfast spirit within us. And again, Lord, we just ask you again to fill us with your Holy Spirit and lead us and guide us once again. And we thank you, Lord, for the sermon tonight from David Jeremiah that, about the armor. And each and every one of us need to gird our lawn with truth. Your word is truth. And each and every day we need to take your word and memorize that word so that we can use it when it's time. I know that your word have we hid in our hearts that we may not sin against you, Lord. And again, we thank you for your word, which is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path each and every day. As we always, Lord, want to take the time to read, to study your word, so that we'll know we won't have to hear it from somebody else and assume that it's your word. We need to know it in our hearts. And again, Lord, we want to continue to pray for those that are out there. But most importantly, we continue to pray for the marriages, those that are broken, Spiritually, mentally, physically, we ask for healing. And we continue to pray that you bring them together, Lord, that you may reconcile them once again. 
And again, Lord, we just continue to pray for those that are grieving because they lost their loved ones. We ask for healing for them as well. Always, Lord, we just want to walk by faith and not by sight. As we always want to give you the praise and the honor and the glory, thanking you for your peace, your joy, your strength, your love, and your protection. We thank you, Lord, again for hearing and answering our prayers. And we thank you for this program that we are able to lift your name, that we are able to praise your name and let the world know that there is a God and he will see you through. But what we have to do is surrender our lives to you. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. And you all have a great night. We'll see you tomorrow night. May God bless you. And may the windows of heaven open and pour upon you a bundle of blessings. And have a good night. Oh, because of who you are, I give you glory. Yes, I do. Because of who you are, I give you praise. Oh, Jesus, because of who you are. Just lift up your hands and just begin to worship. Hallelujah. He's worthy to be praised. Thank you, Jesus.